you guys and using this piece here which was inked on Strathmore's mixed media paper I like using this paper for Copic stuff um, it allows me to apply multiple layers and the very first thing we're going to do is we're gonna make a mask and we're using graphics frisket to do that now I tried this out the other day in my art snacks video and I loved it I've never been able to properly do a mask with um, alcohol based markers but this is perfect it's a low tech self-adhesive plastic sheet that forms a um, protective layer over your work and the first thing you really want to do is you want to transfer your image so you know where you're um, trimming and I'm just going to use some low tack washi tape to tape it down so my frisket doesn't move around when I am copying over my image and you can get frisket at um, well, you know, I haven't actually seen it in the wild too much um, at brick and mortar art stores, but I did get mine off of Amazon. So you can you can get it on Amazon. It comes in um, packs with multiple uh, you, you have multiple options in terms of how big your pack of like eight and a half by 11 uh, frisket masking paper is, or you can buy it by the roll. And I think in the future, I'm gonna buy it by the roll because it's going to give me a lot more flexibility as to how big I can work. And I'm just using a Sharpie to trace the areas I wanna mask. And I, I'm using a Sharpie because it will adhere to the plastic and you don't want to use something water-based because it will just sort of sit on top of the plastic and get all over the place. And this is a really simple um, masking method that can be accessible to anyone who has access to this masking paper. Um, it really doesn't take much knack, which is nice because uh, it's kind of hard to goof it up and you get fairly consistent results. And sometimes those are the best techniques of all because, and I see if I was smart, I would have aligned this with the bottom of the paper and the corner, but I am not smart. <laughs> In this instance, I'm not smart. I didn't do that. But I'm pointing it out so you can do it and you can be smarter than me. And isn't that always the goal for the student to surpass the master? All right, so got the outline traced. Just carefully lift it up so it doesn't tear your paper. And carefully remove your adhesive tape. And you're going to want to cut out with a pair of sharp scissors or a knife the areas you traced. These are right now my sharpest scissors, unfortunately. It's time to either get my sharp scissors uh, replaced or get them sharpened. So I'm cutting out these two little circles and I'm gonna cut this out. And um, you really wanna leave, don't throw this away. This stuff is good to the last drop. It's not overly expensive, but you know, why throw away perfectly good frisket? Now I'm gonna cut out one of these little breath, it's like breathing cold weather things. And I'm gonna adhere it for you guys so you can see this in action. And then I'm going to pause the video and finish cutting out the whole thing and get back to you when I am doing my Copic wide wash. Now, the hardest part of this is separating the paper from the plastic because it is thin and fiddly. So my only real complaint about this is it would be useful if they had a, ha, got it, a thicker paper on the back because it would make it easier to remove. You could even write like um, this side up kind of thing to designate where it goes. See, clearly that wasn't perfect, but it's so low tech that if you're very careful, you can peel it up and reposition it. And for some reason, this is smaller than expected. So there we go. I'll get back to you guys once I've put all of my masking um, paper, masking adhesive down.
All right, so we've got our masking frisket down and you'll notice that I do have some bubbles. In an ideal world, I would have no bubbles at all. Um, with larger pieces like this, you might wanna apply it the way you would a sticker where you keep the paper backing on it until it's all, all down. Um, or you could do it in pieces. You know, whatever works for you. I found it a little hard to apply like this, but I think that the fault was mine. So I've got a Copic Wide in BV23, and I've got a Copic Spritzer in the same color. And the nice thing about this is I can quickly apply a color wash, and this will be reserved. So this isn't going to be as dark as this. Now, if I wanted to do a all over tone, I could use a much lighter blue violet, and then mask this off, apply this, and then remove it. So, it is, it does however, make that alcohol marker run, the uh, Sharpie, so keep that in mind. That actually isn't a big deal with this. So, I wonder what we can use with masking frisket to transfer, maybe a china pencil, but then you gotta wipe it off. What do you guys use with your masking frisket, those of you who use it? Or do you wipe it down? That might be, that might be the key. And it's gonna sit on that plastic because it's not soaking in. See where it's pulled up? And you could either, um, you know, use that and paint with a like a colorless blender onto another sheet of paper that has a coating on it. This work. Um, or you can let it dry and just uh, toss it if you so choose. See, that's how it would look if you pick it up to paint with it. So that's how I apply um, masking frisket to um, reserve areas of white or other color when I'm using alcohol-based markers. I, for those of you who are interested in how the rest of this piece goes, um, I guess keep watching. So I'll see you in a bit. Okay, so my pools of alcohol ink are mostly dry. If you wanna make sure they're entirely dry so they don't get all over the place, you can use a paper towel to sort of dab them up. And here's a rag that I had sitting around. Oh, that's dry. That would come up. I mean, it'd get all over my hands, but it doesn't really wanna come up. So I can go ahead and pull this up as it is. So um, I attached a little thin, like garbage strip at the bottom because I'd had um, an area where it didn't come up perfectly. And now we're gonna remove the main piece of masking frisket. And you wanna pull slow because you don't want the frisket or your paper to tear. And you can use a craft knife if you're having trouble getting it up to just sort of um, gently pick it up. And you can see where it's seeped in a little bit underneath. All right, so that's how you use masking frisket to mask off an area on uh, your paper when using alcohol markers. Hey guys, so I just showed you how I use uh, masking frisket to mask off an area. Uh, now we can move on, make some progress with this piece. And what I always do is I have a little book where I swatch out my colors. So I'm gonna do that and check back in with you. Okay, so I have all my colors swatched out. Now, um, when I am selecting colors for a piece, what I'll do is I will pull from my, my whole color family, I'll pull likely candidates, and I'll start swatching them. And as I realize what things I want, what things I don't, I'll put a cross or exit out and then um, go ahead and remove those to the side so they're not around. And um, I then, I can't pull out anymore, I'm afraid. I then sort everything in the order of use. And I just find that this, um, 
this wouldn't be a technique I would recommend for conventions because it does require a lot of space, but it allows me to go through things fairly quickly and talk about them at the same time. So that's how I select colors. That's how I swatch colors. That's how I determine a color palette when I'm using alcohol markers. All right, guys, so let's get rendering. I'm gonna start with skin first, and this is Kara. You guys have seen her around. She's very pale skinned with freckles. So I'm gonna show you guys how I render Caucasian skin with freckles. And I'll probably have a follow-up tutorial with Naomi, who's African-American, um, soon. So um, many artists will leave areas of white on the skin, and that's a fine way to do it. It's a great way to do it, but I really like lots of layers in my marker pieces and I have a decent selection of alcohol markers to work with so I don't need to hold back. Leaving areas of white is great though if you have a more limited selection or you're working on a paper that can't absorb as much marker or um, you want like a light and airy feel. But that's not necessary for this piece because it's meant to be a cold overcast day, kind of like today was. So I'm starting by putting an all over layer and it's okay if it's a little bit streaky because you're gonna go over it again with E00 Skin White. And I'm letting the tip of my marker do most of the work. Now um, I will then apply another layer of E00, sort of knocking in the basic shadows. So um, I like to do the bridge of the nose and up. I tend to put that in shadow, especially if the person has bangs, as Kara clearly has bangs. And I like to do the curve of the face. And underneath the nose. And then I might do an entire side of the face in shadow, um, at least at this, at this stage where I'm just knocking in very basic light layers. And the nice thing about using alcohol markers, especially Copics, on a, um, absorb a paper that has um, can really absorb a lot of ink, is you will get a, a definition between your layers. So that's layer one. Um, and I might even do another layer with the same color. So I might do up to three layers just to really saturate some areas. I'm not covering exactly the same layers I covered the previous round um, because I'm trying to build up volume. So I'm about done with E00 for right now. Next, I'm going to use E51 Milky White, which is a little less saturated than E00. And if you work quickly on thirsty papers like this, you're gonna get very smooth blends. Very little need to go back and forth between colors unless you want to. Now, if you want um, a more distinctive line, if you want your line to show up more, um, you should wait about five minutes so that the ink can fully dry and then apply your next layer. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and start knocking in some blush. And I'm going to use one of Blix Studio brush markers 094 shell to do that. Um, and I use Blick Studio Brush Markers almost as much as I use Copic Markers. I really like them. You can watch some of my other videos where I talk about these markers more in depth, um, or you could read the blog post about them. So when I do blush, I like to do under the nose, under the lip, and then around the corners of the eyes, following the frame of the face, like that. And I also do the eyelids. And people have different ways of doing blush. So if this doesn't work for you, or if it doesn't work for your character or the skin tones you're using, because sometimes this method doesn't work, um, that's fine. This is just how I use it in this instance. So I'm gonna let that dry a little bit and go ahead and give it another layer to sort of deepen it. I really want to get the most out of each marker before I move on to the next uh, la, 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 the next color because it helps um, give me smoother blends. So next I'm using E93 T-Rose and that's a Copic. And this one is um, kind of, a, a, it stands out a lot more. So it was good that I went ahead and used the Blick Studio Brush 094 in shell first. And you can, if it stands out too much for you, you can use shell to sort of knock it back a little bit. 
her nose would be pretty pink because it is cold. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and set my two blush colors to the side because I might need them again. And I'm gonna use E93 to keep working on building up those shadows. Now I'm starting to outline the shadow that the bangs would cast on her face as well as coloring her eyelids. And if you find you've made a mistake, you can always use one of the prior colors you've used, one of the prior colors you've used to sort of knock this back on the page. Now I'm gonna give it another layer, but only in certain areas where that shadow would be the most intense. Now, if you find that um, all of this has knocked your blush back too much, you can use a darker color like RO2, which is a more saturated pink, to really pump up the volume on that blush. And um, when I'm done with markers, I move them out of the way to clear up space. It helps me clear my head too. So this is going to be, oh, actually what I should do is I should switch over to the blue violets. And I like to use blue violets to shade skin because it's sort of like the natural complement. And I'm going to use BV20, blue lavender. And you don't want to use too much of this on the face because it'll look muddy and um, just sort of like a zombie kind of. So I guess if you're rendering a zombie, this is great, but um, you want to be very judicious with where you use your blue violets on the skin. Because since it's a, a complementary color, it'll sort of desaturate as well as push back the um, ink you just put down. Now you could put it under the nose. I'm not going to put it under the nose because I have a problem with, um, sometimes I will do too much of it and it looks like a little Hitler mustache and nobody wants a Hitler mustache. So I'm not going to continue to use BV20 underneath noses. I'll just leave it the natural sort of pink and use a less saturated um, earth, earth tone or skin tone. Okay, so um, now I'm moving back over into the E's with E34. to add a little bit of warmth and help blend that blue violet. You'll still be able to see the like influence of the blue violet, but it's not going to be as striking. And you could even use a little bit of it under the nose if you wanted to. I'm gonna skip that. So um, from here on, I'm going to do freckles and we're going to use E34, E13 and E23, so these two, to do freckles. And the thing about freckles is they're not perfect circles, so you sort want to sort of sketch in a variety of kind of um, oblong shapes in a variety of sizes, because they're not all like little dots of pepper. And people have different kinds of freckles. Freckles come in a variety of colors and um, shapes. So, so you might want to do a little quick reference. Look it up. I like to use a couple different colors when I'm doing freckles because it looks more natural. And I also like to have one or two that are a little darker than the rest, just because that's how my freckles are. And freckles do overlap. So if you want realistic freckles, you should go in that direction as well. So that is how I render skin and freckles for Caucasian characters. Hey guys, so I'm going to be rendering eyes and um, I had used BV20 to shade her skin. So I'm gonna use BV20 to add some shine and dimension to her eyes. And if you guys have a colorless blender, now would be a good time to pull it out. I like to add a lot of shadow to my eyes, especially the upper halves. And that's just a stylistic choice. It's not really based on observation or real life. It just, I think it works with my style of drawing. And we're gonna use a colorless blender to knock back some of the intensity of that blue violet. 
then later on in the process, I'm going to add white highlights back into the eyes using um, a white Signo pen in Copic Opaque White. So if you're interested in that, keep checking. Now we're not really trying to blend the blue violet into areas where it wasn't already. We're actually trying to push it back so it's less intense. That's the way alcohol markers work. And now I'm going to add it a little bit. And while I'm doing this, I'm going to do her teeth as well as these little puffs of air. You might have noticed that when I render with markers, I pretty much use the brush tip exclusively and that's because it does most of the work for me. I can be very gentle and put very little weight on it and get a very fine line, or I can kind of bear down on it and get a much thicker fill. So the next step in rendering her eyes is to put down a layer of, where is it? YR14, so caramel. And it's kind of an orangey color, but when her eyes are finished, it's gonna really pop and look like the light's hitting her eyes. And people with brown eyes can have um, a variety of different colors come out when the light hits them just right. So that's something that's definitely worth referencing if you don't have brown eyes yourself. While it's still wet, I'm gonna go over it with E08. And if I want, I can blend between the two and soften the transition. You don't have to though. The technique works pretty well both ways. Now, if I want some definition in her eyes, I can wait and allow the ink to dry, which will take a couple minutes. Uh, if I'm not looking for that, if I'm looking for a smooth blend, I can go ahead and start applying my last color, E59. So see that YR we put down at the beginning, it looks much less like an orange and it looks much more like highlight now. So that's how I, in general, handle eyes, especially anime influenced or anime style eyes. Let's do some hair. Her hair is almost the same color as her eyes and we're gonna be doing the eyebrows too. So let's start with E08 and we're going to apply that pretty much all over with a flicking motion of our wrist. And it's okay if it's a little streaky because we're gonna do another uh, layer on top of it. All right, time for the next layer. Now this one, we wanna start um, maybe not filling it in as much. Basically leaving an implied highlight, which is actually hard to see with this color. Um, and my apologies for that. If you don't knock in your highlight at this stage, that's okay. You can always add it with white or even a color pencil in the color that you think would suit the hair you're rendering. Next, I'm gonna use E59 Walnut to continue to add some depth and dimension to her hair using flicking strokes. And if you work fast, your strokes will blend together and they'll be less streaking. And at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and fill in her eyebrows pretty much with hair. Every layer I do covers a little bit less than the layer before, and that helps sort of enforce highlights. I wanna do the eyebrows. Now, you notice that when I first put down the eyebrows, I just filled it in. I really didn't pay attention to the direction. I have little lines drawn in on her eyebrows, sort of like the direction that the hair is growing. And on your second layer, you want to enforce that by making sure your marker brush strokes are in the same direction. Now, this is a fine time to talk about eyelashes. You can, if you have an inking style similar to me where you kind of leave your eyelashes open in some parts, you can go over that with your marker 
um, and just sort of fill it in and that'll give it like a hint of the hair color and it'll also make it look like it like uh, the inks belong on the page. All right, one last color for the hair and that is Dark Bark E49. And there are many, many fantastic ways to render hair. And if you'd like to see me demonstrate some other hair colors or hair types, just leave a comment and let me know what you'd like to see and I would be more than happy to oblige. Now, if you think the transition between one brown and the other is too, too different, too striking, you can always go back with the previous brown you used and blend it out. So I could use E59 Walnut to blend out E49. And to do that, you start um, a little bit in on your, on your latest layer. So I would be starting here and I blend out towards my last layer of E59. And again, that's not mandatory. It's just something to do if you um, are a little dissatisfied. The nice thing about markers is they're very workable. So that's how I render hair. All right, so um, now we're on to clothing and there's a couple of different textures we've got going on. We have this knit texture here on the hat and here on the cowl, and then we have sort of a woolly texture on the, the cloak itself. So um, I think I'm going to start with, hmm, I know I want it to be yellow and gray. I was still deciding whether or not I wanted the the cap and the cowl to be yellow or gray and the jacket being the reverse. I think I'm going to go with the jacket being um, yellow and I think I'm going to go with the hood being gray and that'll make her face pop a little bit more than the yellow would because the yellow would be more saturated than what's going on in her face. So I'm going to start with C3. And because this is knit, I want to do sort of like a scrubby, scrumbling sort of scribble stroke. And it's okay if you leave areas of white because knit would have um, areas of highlight. All right, let's move on to her uh, cowl and the tassels. And I like to start with a lighter color than I'm going to end up with because I enjoy building up my colors and this gives me something to leave as a highlight that isn't plain white. Some artists like leaving the plain white. That's fine, it works, it looks good. Um, this is just how I, in particular, render with alcohol-based markers. What's important is that you find how they work for you. And with a knitted piece, you're going to want soft transitions between colors. So you may find yourself blending back and forth a bit. My C3 says it's in need of a refill, so I might be doing that after this video. Okay, so we've got our basic layer filled in. Now we could do another layer with um, C3, or I can move on to the next color I want to use, which is actually BB25, because it's got, it's, um, it's a blue violet, and it feels a little warmer than the cool grays I'm using. And it also would go well with the background color, which is a, it's like blue violet 23. Yeah. So this is a much darker blue violet. And I am going to leave areas of white. Well, not white, actually, it's going to be C3 because that's my highlight. And I'm going to blend some of that back using the C3 after I have filled in the hat and the cowl. All right, so now I'm going to blend some of those highlights using the C3. I'm gonna blend the color around it a little bit lighter and I'm going to blend the color inside the highlights a little bit darker so there will still be highlights, but they're not going to stand out as much as they did because I have a 
uh, I want to do another layer of BB25, and then I want to do a layer of BB29. And you'll note that I haven't done the tassels yet. I'm going to handle those separately. Now I'm going to use the BV25 to blend out some of um, these dark areas of shadow, just sort of smooth them out a little bit. And I'm gonna go back in on the cowl and the, and the hat and do one fire, final layer with BV29. So the cowl and the cape are basically finished and um, later on I'll show you guys how I can add um, transparent layers of a white to sort of lighten certain areas up as well as opaque layers of white to really lighten things up. But net for now, let's get those tassels done. I'm going to fill them in with a base coat of C3. I'm going to start rendering shadow with BV25. And I'm going to blend that back out with the C3 I just used. Now I need to let that dry because I want my next layer to show up distinctly against the prior layers. So when it ceases to feel cool to the touch, it's pretty much dry. Alright, so that layer's dry. Time to add some more shadow. And now I can start going in with BB29. And I'm adding, um, so when you look at uh, knitwear, the threads, you can see the individual threads making up each uh, piece of yarn. So I'm drawing those in and then I'm going to go back over it with the color I just used, BB25, to sort of soften how they look. Now the final layer. And I'm only doing that in the very darkest parts. So there's going to be very little of this. You could also, if you wanted, add the white strings as highlights at the end. All right, so that's how I render knitwear. Hey guys, I'm going to be rendering this uh, jacket now. And I've already decided on my color palette. It is a big handful of yellows, starting with Y32. and I'm just going to fill in the whole jacket. All right, now I'm gonna go over it with Y32 again. If you wanna, um, if you wanna condense this into one step, you just need to move a lot sl slower than I do, making careful little circles to saturate your color. Now, papers that aren't as thirsty as mixed media paper, which is designed to be used with almost anything you can throw with it. It can take light watercolor, it can take uh, color pencil, it can definitely take marker. Um, but there are definitely papers that are not as thirsty and they'll either bleed through or if you have a non-absorbent surface underneath, you'll find that your colors start to pool and they aren't saturating as much. So um, Depending on the type of paper you like to use and depending on your rendering techniques, you may encounter a barrier for color application. I've noticed this barrier on Copic PM paper and, um, you know, I still enjoy using Copic PM paper, but it has its place. 
If you want to extend the amount of absorbency your paper has, one thing you can do is not work on a glass surface. You can work with like blotter paper underneath and that'll um, create additional layers for inks to soak into. So we've got two layers of Y32 down and I'm just checking real quick, it hasn't bled through yet. It is bleeding through to the other side, but I don't mind, I don't care about that. So now it's time for me to start knocking in my shadows. And if I can do it with Y32, I will. If I can't, I'm gonna move to the next color in my setup, uh, 009 Honey Yellow. And that's a Blick color. This happens to be a Copic. And it looks like I can get a little more depth of color actually a fair bit more depth of color, so I'm going to continue using Y32. Sticking with the same color for multiple layers makes for pretty much perfect blends because there is no difference between, other than saturation, there's no difference between the color. It also means you don't need as large a collection and you run a smaller risk of accumulating uh, duplicate markers. Alright, so we are done with uh, cashmere. It's time to move on to honey yellow. And honey yellow is a fair bit darker than cashmere, so um, you might want to blend between the two in order to achieve a, a less noticeable gradient. Now, if you find the difference between your two colors just too, too striking to ignore, you can always go over the entire area with the color you used previously. And that'll help marry the two colors together. There is a discrepancy. It's less visual, it's less noticeable for you guys on camera, but there is, um, cashmere is more of a honey, or a, I'm sorry, a melon color and honey yellow is more like a honey mustard. Um, so, something else I can do is I can go back with a more yellow, um, a light yellow, like buttercup yellow, and go over the entire surface to sort of blend the two together, together better. This will add more of a yellow cast to cashmere, and will sort of knock back honey yellow a bit. Now we can resume using honey yellow to add some shadows or we can move to a darker color like 063 yellow, yellow ochre, yellow ochre to start putting in some shadows. And on this cape we want the shadows to be where the tassels would be casting a shadow, underneath the clasps, and even on the join of the coat. And a coat like this is just begging for decoration and we're gonna do that together with color pencils. Now, before you get too much too invested in adding shade with your yellows, you can always use a blue violet to add some shadow as well. And I'm going to use, where's BB20? I'm gonna use BB20, the same one I used on Kara's skin, to desaturate my yellow a bit and add some cast shadow. And you don't wanna go too overboard because it can make your piece look muddy, but it definitely reads as a shadow. My last color is Y26 Mustard. And I'm just going to use it very sparingly. And all that remains are the details and the toggle before we move on to the surface decoration. So I wanted to keep the yellow going and I'm going to use 063 as the base color on the threads on her toggle. And I'm going to let that dry and move on to the shoulder details and the toggle clasps. And I actually want those to be a lighter gray 
and maybe even leather so they would have a bit of a shine to them. Now the shine can be, you can either leave the paper color to shine through or you can go back and add it with white. I'm going to leave it and do it with white a little bit later on. Now to go back and add some thread lines on the clasp. And I'm not going to be able to get them as dark as I would like, so I'm going to have to switch over to... Hmm. I'm going to have to switch over perhaps to light umber. Let's swatch it though before we put it down because once it's down, it's a lot harder to fix. See, that's a little too, too warm, a little too saturated. That was light umber. Let's try antique. Antique is perfect. That is exactly the color I need. See, I'm glad I swatched it because this was too hot and that's just right. So we're using 069 antique. It's a Blick marker. And I'm gonna go over that just a bit with mustard. All right, so we have the basic surface filled in. So I will see you guys soon to do some surface design. Hey guys, I'm interrupting my regular, regularly scheduled marker tutorial to bring you a Spectrum Noir uh, color pencil unboxing. And I'm interrupting it because I wanna use these color pencils in the tutorial. So they came wrapped in a plastic wrapper, easy enough. They are sealed on one side with a sticker. Those always take a minute. There we go. Case seems pretty nice. I have the 24 piece set for florals and they promise a fine point. Ooh, okay. We've got a little bit of advertising here. We've got a piece of foam and we've got some lovely looking color pencils. So that was my super quick Spectrum Noir unboxing. I hope you guys enjoyed it. So I looked up Swedish folk embroidery to give me some reference and I'm going to be trying out some Spectrum Noir color pencils to um, handle the surface design with. Now I've never used these color pencils before. They might, um, they might be terrible for all I know, although I've seen several other artists say they enjoy using them. This is not a review though of these particular color pencils. Um, if I don't like them, I'm gonna go and run and grab my Derwent Color Soft. So um, I was sort of planning on doing the, <laughs> something I don't really recommend for you guys and freehanding it by sketching it out first and then filling it in. And I do a lot of um, sketching in color pencil. So I am moderately confident that what I can't, if I can't get it right, I can fix it. <laughs> we'll find out together. Um, so Swedish embroidery has um, a lot of floral patterns, a lot of simplified but very attractive designs. Um, and they use, it uses bright colors, which I thought would be really nice on this jacket. So I'm looking at examples and I'm trying to figure out a sort of repeating pattern that I could create based on the inspiration at hand. Um, if you guys are unfamiliar with Swedish embroidery or Swedish folk embroidery, I highly recommend you look at it, especially if you like my stuff. Um, uh, because I have been incorporating more and more of it into my art. So I'm gonna try and get one of these lovely color pencils. I wasn't being facetious. I realized it sounded kind of facetious. One of these lovely color pencils out and this is a nice purplish color. I'm gonna sharpen it to a little bit of a finer point and then I'm going to sketch the details I want onto, onto her jacket. If you are more patient than I am, you can do this step at the very end and spray a spray fixative on top of your work to give it some tooth because this paper doesn't have a lot of tooth, so there's not much for the color pencils to bite into. And I already started with a pretty dark purple, so there's not a whole lot darker I could go. For those of you who have never used color pencils with markers, they actually work really well together. They work very nicely. Um, you do want a bit of um, tooth to your surface though. 
because it will give your color pencil something to bite into. Now, if I wanted, I could blend my color pencils out using an alcohol, a colorless alcohol blender. But I don't want to do that. Ooh, they leave a lot of, a lot of dust on the paper because I'm afraid it might push some of the color underneath out. Now, um, I might give it a try anyway, because I'm really big on saying I don't want to do something on camera and then I do it and it either turns out fine or it looks terrible. Um, I'm trying to keep my pencil strokes in the direction that the embroidery would be, the embroidery thread would be moving in. I'm going to go ahead and move on. These are very crumbly to a little bit of a darker purple. Actually, let's, uh, there we go. Okay, so the crumbs brush off very quickly. And if there are any accents that would be white, I'm going to, hmm, I don't have a white in here. So I can either go get a color soft or wait until the end when I'm doing all my other white highlights and show you how I do it. Now, this is the floral set, so you notice that I don't have any greens. I do actually have a lot of nice skin tones and florals, so pretty, pretty satisfied. Oh, that's a skin tone. That's not... I might not have a dark enough brown in these. Might have to go get some different ones later on. Um, definitely going to need another set for the green sort of flowers. I'm just sort of lightly sketching in petals of the flower while looking at some reference I pulled up. And it's okay if it doesn't look exact. I'm not trying for historical accuracy. I'm just trying for a pattern. And on paper like this, which is mixed media paper, you could even use watercolor on top of this for whatever kind of effects you want to achieve with watercolor. And I have a tutorial on using watercolor with alcohol-based markers in my playlist that you guys should check out if you're interested. And I like to, when I'm doing a pattern, even if it's kind of like a freehand, uh, non-repeating pattern, I like to have some of them uh, go off the edge of the page or be covered by other objects because it looks more realistic. It also makes the surface look fuller without as much effort. So it's a little bit of a cheat. But in the end, all that really matters when you're making art is that it looks good. That's, well, not even that it looks good. That it, you get the job done and it's the best it could be. Now, as lovely as this 24 set is, and it really is a lovely set, I've got to go get some other colors because a lot of pinks and yellows, not a lot of greens and blues. I'm back and I've got my trusty Durawent Color Soft set full of some lovely colors and they are all richly pigmented, so they should go down nice and smooth. And I'm working on leaves. So I start with the lightest color I'm going to be using for the leaves. I'm going to work my way darker. And I'm just sketching them in right now. And you guys can't see it, but I do have reference up in front of me. If you're going to freehand something, especially um, patterns you're not all that familiar with, I really recommend you have some reference because it makes it so much easier than trying to guess. I mean, if you already had something in mind before you got started, that's one thing. But if you're like, this needs something, this, this is looking kind of empty, then I really recommend you work with reference. So I'm adding green and the color softs layer really nicely. And now I think I want some blue.
And you don't want to press too hard when you're using colored pencils, especially if you're not using a solvent to help blend, because you want to leave room on the paper surface for you to apply additional layers to help blend. Now, color softs are really nice for blending because they are soft and very pigmented. I think I want to add, hmm, maybe a little bit of brown to the base of the flowers. And a little bit of white. Oh, that'll blend it, wow. <laughs> so that is how you use color pencils with markers, pretty simple. Um, I wouldn't recommend markering on top of the color pencils. I would save that as sort of like your last layer kind of thing. So I'll see you guys soon. All right, so we are almost done with this piece. Now it's time to color in her mouth and add some finishing touches. So when I'm coloring in open mouths, I like to use a dark, like a RV, a dark red violet. And I need to be really careful because if this gets goes out of the line, it's very difficult to fix. Add another layer. I don't even necessarily think I need to use the other one I grabbed. We are nearing the end of this particular piece. So I've got my opaque white kit here and it has pretty much all of the opaque whites I would need, um, ranging from kind of translucent, like this Winsor Newton white blender that works with their pigment markers, but it also really works as a way to add um, layers of white to your marker renders. I have a Recollections opaque white pen. I have a distress marker, uh, yeah, a distress marker in Picket Fence, which is another opaque white. I've got a white chalk pencil. I've got a white Color Soft. I've got a white Ink Tense. I've got a white Signo. I've got a white Jelly Roll and a white Posca brush pen. But before we do that, I've got to put a mask on because I want to, um, I want to add like a sort of a snowy background. So we've got some masking frisket and I'm going to trace her outline and the outline of the, the white breath. And this time I'm gonna be smart and I'm gonna wipe, after I cut it down, I'm gonna wipe the alcohol ink off so it doesn't, actually that wouldn't even matter because I'm going to be using a, an opaque white to splatter on there. So you guys, if you don't know how to create a mask, just watch one of the previous videos or watch earlier in this video. I am gonna go ahead and make my mask and I'll get back to you guys. All right, so I've got a mask, as you can see by the reflection, over Kara and the two little cold weather breath things. And I'm going to use a splatter tool and it's made by Li Liquitex. It's part of their freestyle range. You can do it like this, you can do it like that. And um, I've also got some pearlescent ink. I wanna give that a shake. And it's easier if you have a little container to put it in rather than trying to dip it into the bottle. But you know, I'm gonna be stubborn because I don't wanna have to clean it up. And I wish I could mask off my whole table. Wouldn't that be nice? So I'm going to dip it into, yeah, just like that. That doesn't wanna work with this. and just flick it like that and make a huge mess that I'm gonna spend 20 minutes cleaning up after. That's okay, that's part of making art, right? So the nice thing about masking Kara off is it makes it look like the snow is in the background and she's in the foreground giving us some depth of field. And I wish this paint was thicker because it would be more likely to move instead of just travel up the bristles. It's what happens when you get talked into buying specialty tools. And you're like, oh, I'm totally gonna use it on everything. 
I mean, really, if you, you don't have to go out and buy this, please don't go out and buy this unless you're doing just ginormous murals. Just use an old toothbrush. It's easier, makes the same amount of mess. Doesn't cost $20, costs pretty much nothing. If you don't have a toothbrush, go dumpster diving in your neighbor's garbage can. Take theirs. You can even buy one from the dollar store. Just like, don't brush your teeth with it ever again. That particular brush. So yeah, we've got like more splatter than we have on the paper. Yeah, this is too light to wanna, wanna move. So yeah, and then you're gonna wanna let that dry before you remove your, um, your, your mask. So that is how you apply white, or you could use any color you want, splatter to an area without affecting the, uh, an area you would like to reserve, an area you want unaffected by that splatter. All right, so my acrylic ink has dried and it's dried all over my work surface. So the first thing I wanna do is I'm going to remove the film for you guys and then I'm gonna clean my table off. And I'd actually applied my film in two pieces because um, I'm having problems with distortion where for large areas, what I have drawn on the masking, uh, the masking frisket, even though I'm tr literally tracing, it always ends up getting really distorted. And I'm not sure if it's because the frisket is so, um, so thin that it like stretches as I'm trying to apply it or what. And what's interesting is the, um, yeah, doesn't want to stick to it because it's plastic. So this is what the surface looks like. Uh, let me find my brush. Well, knock that off. All right, so that is the almost finished image. Next, we're gonna explore opaque white. So I'm gonna get this cleaned up and I'll see you guys in a bit. So um, this is why you protect your work surface. Um, these will scrape off and I'll probably spend more time scraping them off later, but for now it's good enough and I wanna finish the video. So this is my opaque white kit. I've gone over this with you guys in the past. And all I really wanna do is add some white highlights here and there. And there's a few ways I can do that. I can use this opaque white to sort of lighten up general areas. And the way this works in this instance is you apply your white and then you step away, let it dry, apply another layer of it. So you have to build up layers of white. But it's perfect for gently softening dark areas, making them just a little bit lighter or adding more, like blending out the color of an eye, the shade on an eye rather, or uh, lighting up some gray like down there. And once the first layer is dry, you can apply the next layer and it'll be a little more opaque and so on and so forth until you reach the level of opacity that you want. And this is a great way to subtly build up layers of white rather than just like, well, bam, very opaque white added to the top of your drawing or your marker render or your watercolor. You can also use a white color pencil to softly add in highlights and you can build up opacity by pressing harder and the Derwent color softs are great for this because they are very pigmented and soft unlike uh, Prismacolors which are very waxy and you can do this with Prismacolors too but it's easier with the, the color softs than it is with the Prismacolor. Now you can also add more opaque whites using an opaque pen like this. This is a Recollections opaque white marker. Um, they make quite a few opaque markers. I happen to like the white one. And of course, there's everybody's favorite, 
the white gel pens, which are used for very small spot highlights or spot corrections even. So that's how I use markers. Um, I'm Becca Hilburn uh, from Natto Soup Studio. I hope you guys have a great day. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to my channel for even more content like this. If you would like to help fund more content like this, please check out my Patreon because I have all sorts of goodies planned for you guys and I just need a little bit of help getting there. So I'll see you guys around. Bye.